Hello everyone, my name is Gyoros Katsikas and I work uh, for Ubitec, a Greek SME in Athens. Um, so, so far we have seen uh, by Ricard and Luis uh, how the Teraflow SDN controller is able to manage different types of devices using uh, netconf, yang, openconfig, uh, TAPI protocols. Uh, in this last session we will get into the P4 uh, protocol, which is a uh, recently, so to say, established uh, protocol since 2014, uh, and it it means to replace OpenFlow, which was introduced in 2008. Uh, this is a way different way of programming uh, data plane devices as compared to netconf, openconfig, uh, yang, and so on. Uh, let, let us finish with uh, with the setup, and I will get into the, the introduction of P4 first, and then I will pass the token to my colleague Panagiotis to. Yes, yes. So th there will be an introduction to P4, and then a short demo. But be because this short demo requires a few preparatory steps from you to uh, establish the environment, uh, Panagiotis will give you a, a quick. Uh, go through those steps so that you can pre-establish the environment as I'm giving the intro to before and then get it ready for the for the demo. Can we go back to the slides? Okay, so uh, in the VM that you all have installed in your laptops, uh, we need to do the following set of steps in order to prepare the P4 environment. The first step is to uh, install a dependency, which is Docker Compose. So uh, apt minus get install Docker Compose should work for everyone. Yes, uh, we have done this already, but uh, in your case, it shouldn't be there. So uh, in case you were asked about a pseudo password, you use TFS123. The second step then is to clone the next generation SDR, SDN tutorial uh, git repository using the following command. This takes us to the advanced uh, feature branch of this tutorial readily. Uh, we use this tutorial, tutorial here because um, people from ONF have already implemented uh, P4 support in Mininet, which is a network so thanks to them, we can now create easily Python topologies with Mininet switches, which uh, run actually uh, P4 data planes. Uh, in this uh, next generation SDN tutorial uh, repo, you have to change there and execute the make dependencies uh, command. This will take some time because it checks out and downloads different Docker containers. Uh, so once you execute this command, uh, just leave it there running. Uh, I will give an intro into P4, and then we will get back to this point uh, to resume the, the mini demo that we have prepared. So as I said earlier, P4 is a really a different way of establishing, of, of, of running and operating networks. And um, because it's based on the notion of a pipeline, let's first define what a pipeline is. So nowadays we have different uh, hardware vendors uh, making chips uh, for network uh, devices. These can be ASICs, FPGAs, NPUs, or even uh, recently with NFV, we can create uh, and run network functions on general purpose CPUs. Um, so a pipeline essentially uh, can, can run on, on all of these types of hardware devices. And uh, it's essentially a set of match action tables uh, in which incoming packets get into the pipeline and go table by table, uh, trying to match different entries in these tables. Uh, once a, a match occurs, then uh, an action is followed by the hardware device and the packet exits the pipeline. 
So this is really the, the definition of a packet processing pipeline. There is some kind of lag in the... Okay, okay. Um, before going into P4, let's explain how P4 emerged. Um, the predecessor of P4 was OpenFlow, which was introduced in 2008. And uh, that was a protocol uh, also based on pipelines and tables. Um, the problem with uh, OpenFlow, though, was that uh, the, the devices themselves at that point in time uh, had everything uh, regarding matching uh, packets fixed into the hardware. So uh, with OpenFlow version 1, you uh, could have support for a single table which provided only 12 uh, match, uh, fixed match header fields for some simple protocols like ARP, IPv4, and so on. Uh, with uh, additional uh, specifications of OpenFlow and uh, more recent versions, we went from 1.0 to 1.4 and 1.5 later on, uh, so as to be able to support additional match, uh, fixed match header fields, uh, and also multiple tables in the pipeline. However, this model did not appear to work very well because every time a new pro OpenFlow specification um, comes in, hand hardware vendors need to redesign the switches from scratch, uh, provide additional support for new protocols, new header fields, and so on. And this did not really scale very well. Uh, so there was a discontinuation of the OpenFlow protocol uh, by... Uh, the Open Networking Foundation uh, after 2015. And uh, accidentally, P4 appeared in July 2014. That was the new way of programming the switches rather than using the OpenFlow protocol. Uh, now we can use P4. So uh, before going into P4, uh, let's see why OpenFlow, let's say, failed to deliver uh, what uh, we call a software-defined data plane. Uh, in the 1.4 uh, OpenFlow specification, we had support for 41 uh, match fields and 17 action types. However, the sad reality was that uh, hardware vendors uh, struggled to support just a very limited set of those uh, match fields and actions in their, uh, in their devices. And every time uh, additional... Uh, requirements uh, come in to, to support different product, more protocols and more header fields, they, ha they had to redesign the hardware, as I said before, which is very costly and very time consuming. So uh, th this is the motivation about before. Uh, instead of repeatedly, repeatedly extending the OpenFlow standards, let's define the whole new abstraction for programming the data plane and get rid of, this, uh, of these restrictions. So among the ma main principles of P4, uh, it's basically a domain-specific programming language to formally define uh, a pipeline in the data plane. And this uh, allows to describe either existing or new protocol headers that we would like to support. Lookup tables, actions, counters, meters, packet metadata, and so on. And now, uh, with this P4 model, we are able to run uh, programmable data planes on uh, different kinds of devices, including ASICs, FPGAs, or even uh, slower software-based switches, uh, and so on. The additional thing about P4 is that it also offers a common management interface uh, for parsing those packets and, and matching the, these arbitrary header fields. Uh, which essentially uh, provides a, a contract between the control and the data planes. Um, P4 was based on the PISA, uh, Protocol Independent Switch Architecture. I will tell you a few words about this uh, to understand how uh, the internals of the switch look like when a packet enters into, the, into the, uh, a P4 switch. First, the switch involves a programmable parser, uh, which is basically there to identify the type of uh, packet that enters the pipeline uh, and whether we can support parsing different types of headers like Ethernet, IPv4, IPv6, and so on. 
Then the packet enters into the pipeline, which is a set of tables with match action commands. And then uh, there is a set of uh, queues, essentially, egress queues, where uh, the packet is deparsed and sent uh, towards the, the next hop. Um, so once a programmer uh, implements a new P4 program, this is compiled using a target-specific compiler. And uh, the first thing that uh, occurs is uh, we translate the P4 program into a, a programmable parser, which is able to understand the, the headers that we have specified inside the P4 program. In this specific case, we have headers about Ethernet, VLAN, IPv4, V6, TCP, and UDP, for instance. Then we can start a controller, uh, which may run some uh, overlay network applications like routing, firewall, NAT, and so on. And this controller is able to program those tables with entries uh, for different tables in the pipeline, like, for example, uh, layer two uh, tables for matching uh, the MAC, MAC addresses or uh, routing tables, uh, NAT tables, and so on. And finally, when a packet comes in, it, uh, it is parsed and then sent to the pipeline, matching the different entries uh, as it goes towards the, the egress queues. This is the way that the, the P4 pipeline is realized. Uh, we said earlier that there was a problem with uh, uh, sweet ASIC vendors, basically, back in the OpenFlow times when they didn't really implement uh, all of the match header fields that the OpenFlow specification was describing. Uh, hopefully, this has changed recently. We have new custom ASICs, which offer more, more flexibility than uh, was available before uh, at several terabits per second speeds uh, nowadays, which is good. But also, this additional flexibility that allows us to run P4 programs on different targets simply because it's a target-independent language, we can compile using different compilers uh, the same P4 program towards different types of devices, FPGAs, NPUs, and even software switches. To do so, we have the P4 runtime, which is a runtime control API for P4-defined data planes. Just to make a comparison between uh, P4 runtime and the predecessor, the OpenFlow, uh, both of them are target independent because with the same API, uh, we can program different switches from different vendors. They're both pipeline independent in the sense that with uh, the same API, we can control many arbitrary pipelines within a device. But the difference between those is essentially that OpenFlow is not protocol independent. So uh, we, have, we had protocol headers and actions hard-coded in the specification. Uh, while this is not the case uh, in P4 anymore. Uh, just to define quickly what a, a, a full P4 workflow is, uh, we start with a simple, uh, let's say, P4 device, which uh, runs a switch operating system on top of it. It can be something like an ONIA, ONL, all these kind of uh, switch operating systems that are out there. Um, Part of this switch, uh, within the switch operating system, we can run a P4 runtime server, which is essentially uh, a software that uh, expects P4 runtime commands from a client external to the switch. With this client now, uh, can be wrapped inside a controller. This is what we have done in, in Terraflow, and this is what was also done in other controllers, like Onos, for example. Uh, so it can be part of a P4 driver inside this controller and realize uh, this southbound interface between the controller and the P4 device. So this is the, the environment for us. Now, when we uh, implement a specific P4 program, the first step is that uh, once the program is written is to, to get it compiled through a target-specific compiler. This compiler generates two types of outputs. The red one is the P4 binary file, which is target specific and has to do with a specific device that we would like to program using P4. And the second one is the P4 info file. I'll tell you first about the binary. So 
depending on the device, this can be an ASIC binary configuration or an FPGA bitstream or even a JSON file for software-based devices. So this file tells exactly the device what to do about this program, how to process the packets. The second file, though, is a device-independent uh, compiler output or target-independent compiler output, which simply specifies the contract between the controller and this device and provides the controller a schema for uh, handling the runtime or managing the runtime of the device. This is the whole uh, workflow, how we go from a specific P4 program down to the device and through uh, uh, an SDN controller. As I said already, this, is, uh, this, this whole workflow is implemented within Teraflow ecosystem using a specific P4 driver. And now we will get into a mini demonstration uh, of a P4, uh, simple P4 topology that my colleague Panayotis will uh, further elaborate. Thanks for, for this. Yes. Uh, so first of all, I hope that uh, everyone has completed this make dependencies uh, part. If somebody is going with uh, the um, demo, please say so if you're okay. Okay. So um, we have to do some uh, two more steps that were described before. Let me go there to be able to follow. Yes. So first of all, we have to copy this. Um, here we, uh, we will use Mininet uh, for this. So first of all, we have to copy the uh, topology of Mininet on the uh, next generation SDN tutorial um, uh, directory. So I'm going to use this. You can uh, copy this command as it is. Come on. Sorry. Basically, uh, if you have ever uh, worked with Mininet, you can uh, we can check this. Uh, ah, this is another page, right? Okay, I can just uh, no, it is also here. Sorry, uh, all this part is in SRC. No, it's okay. We will. Yeah, we got it here. Uh, th this um, this file can be found here. It is the topology as uh, described by Mininet uh, API. So basically, we describe that we want to have uh, a switch that will be a Stratum B MV2 switch, and also two clients. One will be uh, let's say client and uh, two hosts. Sorry, one will be uh, client, one will be server. And also for the, the, for this demonstration, we have hard coded the R tables. So here we describe. Uh, the ARP entries for one and the other. Uh, so uh, we have copied it to the um, to the next generation SDN tutorial. Um, sorry. Okay, uh, we have copied it here, and uh, then we have also to uh, edit a little bit the make file. Oh, sorry. Uh, we can go here under start and we will just sorry ah, oh, okay <laughs> thank you Luis Luis has already done it uh, just add these two lines uh, somewhere under start these two lines can also be found in the presentation here so after we have done this we are ready oh mm. uh, Luis I want your help <laughs> How is the column? <laughs> Where's the column? The column. Uh, uh, here? This one? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so after that, we can do a make start. Uh, symbol. And this will fire up Mininet with our, um, with our topology. And after that, we can make a uh, make mn dash cli and this will bring us the uh, cli of mininet let's make a check here if we have if we run nodes we should get these three nodes client server and switch so 
before going on, let me get back to the presentation. Okay, so we have this topology. It is a pretty simple topology. We just want to show uh, that Teraflow can actually um, uh, control this before device. So uh, to, do, to show this, we will have a basically a ping, a bidirectional uh, communication. Uh, client will send an ICMP echo request, and server should reply with an ICMP echo reply. Um, so to do this, we will have to uh, write, as Jorgo said, a P4 program. This P4 program can also be found here under SRC tests netx 2020 uh, 20, sorry 22-P4, and then in the P4 uh, folder, you can find the uh, P4 program and also the uh, compiled artifacts. Okay. Um, here, as you can see, uh, there are some parts, uh, as uh, Euro said before, there uh, we have a parser, then we have some tables, and then the edit parser. So first of all, we have to define the headers, what we are going to parse. In our uh, case, we're just parsing uh, Ethernet. So if you remember how Ethernet is defined, it is just destination address, source address, and then uh, the Ether type, uh, 0800 for uh, IP, etc. So we define this Ethernet. Uh, as you can see here, we have already defined the MAC address type here. And then after that, we go on the parser implementation, and we actually define a state machine. So we begin always by having a state start, and then something, uh, we can also have an if here, uh, based on the, um, on the uh, header we extract. But in this example, it's pretty simple. We just, from start, transition to parse Ethernet. Then in parse Ethernet, we extract the headers. And then we transition to the accept. Uh, this can also be seen here, the parser, and also we then de define some action and some table. So first of all, we define the most basic action that is drop. Uh, if, we, if, we, um, if we hit this action, that means that we mark to drop uh, this package. So we change some field in the metadata, and this will be dropped. And then we also define the set egress port that uh, actually, if we think it in a standard software engineering terms, it is just a function that takes a parameter of the type port number type that is called port number. And then after this is called, we will change in the standard data the egress spec field to the port number. And then we define a table. A table has mainly two parts. First of all, it's some keys. Here it's one, but could be many. And we can select some subset of them. Uh, that defines on some header what, which exact header we want. Here we have Ethernet some field, and, sorry, and how we want to compare on it. Here we have exact. We could also have LPM, longest prefix. We could also have range. Uh, I think these three are mainly what, what are used in before. And also we define then a list of actions that could be done uh, on this table. Here, uh, for example, we have the set egress port, and we also say that the default uh, action is drop. So uh, I will go on the Teraflow. I will go on uh, the Teraflow uh, part now. As uh, Luis uh, showed before with the uh, TAPI and the open config, we have to define, we have to define on some way the device uh, Teraflow is going to control. Here is an example of how we define 4P4. The main uh, fields I would like here to stay is actually the IP address, the port, and also the uh, path to the binary and the info, as uh, Euro said before. And uh, yeah, and also we define some rules that we would like to have. Here, uh, we, for example, the, in this rule, we first define what table we want to match. Here it is the L2 exact table. Then we define the, the fields we want to match on. Here we define that we want to match on destination address and in this particular destination address. This is the client's destination, uh, MAC address, sorry. And then we define what action we want, when this hits, what action we want to do. Here we define that we want to uh, do the action set egress port and with, it, with the, the parameter of port number being one. Uh, so before going on the steps, uh, one last check that you should do is uh, go uh, here in the folder SRC slash test slash next 
22-4. In uh, tests, there is an object.py. Make sure that here on line uh, 57, this IP address is the IP address of your uh, virtual machine. It was the same uh, uh, as before. Ah, it is 15, OK. okay. Okay, so here we have to make sure it is 15. And now, uh, for the demonstration, we have here a uh, minnet. We are going to try and ping. Of course, now this will not happen because uh, the switch in the middle is just a white box. It doesn't have any rules. So the packets go out from the client, but reach the switch, but then the switch just drops them. This is the default action we have, this, we have uh, defined. Uh, then, okay, uh, we have uh, prepared some scripts uh, in order to um, uh, bootstrap the device and create these rules. These can be found on src slash. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, where's the slash? <laughs> it's uh, like this. Okay. Tests. Okay. Next. Ah, net, sorry. Here, first of all, we run the setup uh, SH script. Oh, we have to leave. <laughs> okay, really fast. <laughs> oh, okay. I was, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, this script, what basically does is uh, now, this may be fixed in, 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 a, in a later uh, version, but right now, uh, as I've said before, the uh, bin and P4 info should be uh, in the pod, in the device pod. So what this does is just copies these artifacts from the VM to the device pod. So let's go on and run this uh, setup. These are copied. Then we will uh, bootstrap the device. So run. Okay. So we can also see that uh, here there, there is a new device now. Ah, here it is. You can see that there is a switch that is enabled with the driver before. Then let me go here. Uh, here again, the ping is nothing. Uh, does nothing because we have uh, connected to the device. However, we have not passed any configuration to it. So now we can run the uh, second script that actually creates this, uh, puts this connection, these uh, uh, rules. So now we have a ping, we have a connection. Again, this can, uh, oh, sorry. we can uh, delete the, um, the, con the, the configuration. So now it stops. And I, just to make sure that everything that goes to the switch is dropped and nothing is stored, uh, we can check that here we have the 150 ICMP uh, sequence number. And if we can, no, sorry. And if we again um, install the rules, you can see that it skipped uh, to 20 uh, packets. So uh, everything uh, arriving on the switch without uh, configuration is dropped. So this was mainly um, the uh, presentation. Sorry if I've rushed. Uh, I just have a point here um, that I would like to to to, to bring in the in the discussion, uh, especially if you're interested in P4, which is the ARPs. So as I said in the beginning, uh, the ARP entries were hard coded in the topology in the mininet. However. This uh, was done to keep this uh, demo simple and uh, this presentation uh, quick. Uh, we could impl implement ARP as we could implement any other protocol and, and more protocols that are, <laughs> are not defined yet uh, in V4. And uh, I just wanted to have this discussion, how could we do this? First, a really bad idea, we can just uh, match on source address or match on some uh, uh, destination that is a multicast and also something other, etc. But first of all, this does not scale. So P4 provides native uh, multicast uh, feature. There is, in the standard metadata, there is a field that uh, you can define if this um, packet that you have received is to be uh, multicasted. 
and also on what group it is to be uh, uh, sent to. For this, you have, first of all, to define an action that is the set multicast group action. And here we have, we uh, define a group ID. Again, the thing is like a uh, function, we just uh, uh, put in the standard metadata dot multicast group this ID. And in our table that we had already used, we just add another action that is the set multicast group. Uh, so we just go and say destination address, it is the multicast, this is the key. When the multicast destination address, we do the action of set multicast group. But also we have to define one more rule, which is this one, which is, uh, this is how we do it on a before, before and time rule, but this can be ported on a, um, on a JSON for the Teraflow. Uh, controller and here we define that we have a multicast group ID of one and we define that egress port one and egress port two are in this multicast group. So when we go back and when we say uh, for example in a rule that destination address should be multicast and then we will call se the set multicast group then we will say one and this will send to these two ports. Uh, this from my side, sorry if I've rushed a little bit.